Okay. And it looks like it didn't report it because Kevin already did it. Well, this is, uh, you know, first, thanks to everyone for, uh, you know, showing up and uh, having an interest in these topics. It's, uh, you know, it's what I, what I enjoy most, uh, is studying and working on this stuff and trying to figure out uh, how to know the consciousness that uh, creates us all a little better. And uh, in, in doing that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's been quite an interesting experience, but it's fun to have people to share it with and to get feedback on ideas and um, get the ability to interact and uh, try to learn what we're doing. Uh, and the, the topic for today is how to meditate and why. And, um, you know, it's, I think the lectures I've been doing the last year have kind of built up to uh, this, uh, you know, I call it, uh, Sort of like in, in the Buddhist traditions, they talk about preliminaries or things that you do or that you study before you start the, the real effort. And then sometimes the, the things are done in parallel. So, you know, we've meditated uh, as we go along, but uh, also having a, a good solid base in, in the, uh, I would say, the philosophical traditions or the conceptual traditions or really understanding uh, what you are. Uh, can make meditation and the practice of meditation much more uh, effective or just simply easier. And, and the more you know about it in some ways, uh, you know, the, the better off. And then uh, to kind of start off and uh, like, you know, people want to uh, respond to some of these fine, you know, we'll keep it kind of open in that sense. But um, questions that I like to discuss when I talk to somebody and uh, they have Usually they have some interest in meditation or in, in the uh, spiritual tradition, a spiritual path, a religious orientation, uh, or they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't come into my life or they wouldn't, you know, be around. But I, I often ask, you know, do you meditate? Uh, and if you do, you know, what type of meditation and uh, how often? And, uh, and it's useful many times to understand how long a person has meditated, uh, if they do, and then where they meditate. Uh, do they have a meditation altar? You know, is there, is there some ceremony that they go through that kind of prepares the mind and the body to move into it? And then do you get results uh, that are like what's described by those who taught you meditation? Uh, and then do you want to deepen the meditation? And then uh, what's the plan? And uh, how are you going to proceed in deepening it? And, you know, you're going to study, or you're going to meditate more, or you're going to uh, maybe integrate yogic practices or uh, Tai Chi or energy awareness into it. There's lots of different ways to approach it. But the, um, I'm assuming, you know, having looked at the, the list of people uh, that, are, that are participating in this today, that uh, since I met, uh, I think everybody that, that I've seen, I've I've met or I've talked to in, in the, the meditation process, or you've been in one of these uh, prior lectures. And uh, so I, I think we can, you know, assume that you do meditate. I think there's probably a lot of differences in what we do, even though uh, all of us uh, were involved with Audley, uh, or most everyone. Uh, there's uh, several different types of meditation techniques that he actually taught at, at different uh, stages in uh, his teaching and uh, in his in his development and awareness and he continually added to it and added you know techniques and practices and uh, you know he was a master at making it the latest greatest experience that you will ever have and uh, I, I always thought he was the ultimate salesman you know and he, he made it all uh, sounds so delicious that I couldn't wait to have another bite and, uh, and to know more about it. And uh, I think that was just one indication of his mastery in a lot of this, uh, in a lot of this area in discussion. But uh, as we you know, think, think on these ideas or these questions, uh, and then uh, 
one of the things I think Kevin shared this on the on the oddly site. And before we meditate, I'd like to uh, to read through this. I, I really appreciate you posting it and uh, really enjoy you know the memories that it triggered for me. And uh, it's it's a poem that uh, oddly either wrote or loved very much, but it uh, it definitely captures his expression. And it says, I am a channel for God's love. God's hands guide me. Uh, God's hand guides me, uh, my thanksgivings. And God gives me an infinite support. I live in an ever-changing now. The divine presence of loving peace, divine order fill my mind. I give thanks. It is so. Divine presence is my knowing. That's a powerful statement. I honor myself by listening. My attention is single-minded. My prayer is without ceasing. I am about my father's business. I'm divinely prosperous in God's expanded horizons. Divine love gives loving health. In God, I live and am inspired. God is all wisdom. God is divine mind. God is within me. Thank you, God. All I need is within me. I accept my responsibility. I am grateful for God's unconditional love. The great source directs me. Realizing God and I are one, I live in the light of my sonship. God, God's consciousness is present within me. The bondage of ignorance is dissolved. God given, God ordained. I am now conscious of it. My life is wondrous. Love is aware, awareness. I become the Christ light within my own self. The radiance is now in my nature. I love, I see, uh, the love I see in others, I am. My life shines with love, peace, and joy. God is the center of my life. And again, thanks, Kevin, for posting. And uh, with that, let's, uh, let's do a, a, a meditation. Uh, we'll do uh, kind of a guided meditation, uh, a little bit in the, the line of uh, the beginning meditation technique that we taught. We'll go probably a, a little bit longer uh, than normal uh, in meditation. And I like to emphasize some of, the, some of the things and some of the points of energy that have been particularly helpful for me in, uh, in waking the body up uh, to meditation. So let's start and uh, I always take a, at least three deep breaths. Focus my consciousness at the top of the head. And then hold awareness there until it's stable or centered or uh, I can be relaxed and there's not, not thoughts uh, that are troubling me or arising in the mind. And for me, the easiest way is the mantra that uh, he gave us at, uh, at initiation time is just to repeat that silently in my mind uh, for a few moments. And it stills the mind and brings it to a calm, peaceful abiding. And then what I'd like to do in the meditation is there's the beginning technique that most of us are familiar with has, uh, as I see it, two kind of distinct parts. Uh, the first one is becoming aware of the life force, the energy that, that activates or uh, enlivens or gives a presence of consciousness within our body. And uh, first we become aware of that life force, that energy. And then second, we use the mind to take control of the energy and focus it. And then we move it to various points in the body to experience and uh, transition through that into a more peaceful state. And uh, normally in the meditation, if you were doing it by yourself or we were doing an extended uh, meditation, we'd go through each uh, meditation 
technique of the two techniques uh, three times. Uh, but today, since we're saying it's a brief meditation, we'll do each one of them once. And it'll just kind of give us a, a basis for a common understanding for how um, the technique was taught. And uh, then I'll refer to it a lot through uh, the, the remainder of the talk. But in the beginning technique, we focus at the top of the head. And it often helps to uh, feel or to visualize a small ball of light or a small flame, like the flame of a candle. And focus that consciousness in that. Uh, some of the techniques I, I often like to contemplate Audley's image when I'm sitting in that space and doing my mantra and feeling the breath come in and out and there's a small ball of light that is very intense. I usually start with a white color and it helps to clear my consciousness and clear my mind. And as I sit there and hold it in consciousness at the top of the head, when I become still in the mind, I can actually feel my breath coming in and out through that center or that chakra at the top of the head. And when I feel that awareness of energy synchronized with my breath, then I know I've got focus and control. And so I bring the ball of light forward into the, the forehead, the third eye area, the center there, the chakra there. And it's a seat of will. It's a seat of, of knowing. And so it can easily intensify and bring it into even a more clear awareness. And then once I feel it there, I bring that ball of energy, that consciousness that I have focused down between my eyes, past the nose, the mouth, the chin, down the throat, divide it when it gets to the the shoulders into two parts and take each of those parts to duplicate balls of light with consciousness and awareness in them. I take it out to the shoulders and I found that if I pause at the joints, major joints in the body like the shoulder joint, it can actually stimulate energy and release energy in that location but it can bring awareness. In some of the traditions, I say the secret knowledge is actually stored in joints within the body. And I found over time that if I pause there and feel the energy, there are small chakras in all of the major joints in the body, small centers of energy, is that I can bring that into my awareness and it helps me to be more aware of the life force. It's like there's sense organs within that that can experience, express or experience that life force. And then from the shoulder, move it down the arm. At the elbow, again, there's a joint, a center of energy, and I can feel that and intensify. And then move it down the arms, the forearm, past the wrist, there's centers of energy there that you can feel and then into the palm of the hand and there's a more of a major center of energy in each hand it's like a chakra or a flower sometimes when you observe those in yourself or in others it may appear to be just a, a radiant sunlight or it may be like a flame or it may be just a healing, glowing presence. But you can feel the energy and it's a very sensitive center. It's a key part of our brain process, our somatosensory or our touch, our feeling nature is tied to that. And we have more nerves to sense in the hands and the fingers. And it allows us to use the body in very unique ways. But we leave that energy in the hand and we offer gratitude for experiencing that life force that comes into us. 
And then with the breath, move back to the top of the head. Stabilize again. This time, rather than going down through kind of the external part of the body with our consciousness, we want to start the process of directing it internally. And so we move forward into the third eye as we had done previously with our ball of energy. We hold it there. We focus our intention to awaken to self and God realization in this lifetime to become one with the self. And that's our intention. And then we move back into the brain, right into the center of the brain. There's various glands there that produce the hormones that allow us to exist and experience all these things. We won't touch those at this point, but there's lots of exercises and techniques with that, but we'll just go right into the center and then enter the brain stem. And then we want to move down through the center of the brain stem and it goes right into the spinal system. I just like to stay right in the central channel, right in the shishumna, right in the spine. Often visualized or seen as a, a tube of light. We want to move our small ball of light gently down into the spinal system. And then as we get to the, the vertebrae and the upper back, the lower back, but all the way along, we want to pause briefly at each at each, each joint, each vertebrae, and sense the difference in energy as it expresses in the different levels. And if you practice this slowly and with concentration, you can become aware of where the, the chakras branch out, or where the branches of energy go out from the central core and bring life force and energy into the, all of our senses, all of our organs, all of our awareness. Remember what we're trying to do here is simply, and this technique is become aware of the life force to experience it with our direct perception and to know but this is the reason, this is why we're alive. You let it just continually move down to the base of the spine. When you get to the base, you divide the energy into two parts. Move out to the hips, major joints in the body. A lot of the tension and Struggles that we carry, challenges in our life, especially fears and things like that are all tied to these centers. And we hold that tension, but let it just relax, dissolve. Everything that arises in the mind, if it's negativity, if it's issues of shame, of guilt, of past, hurt in some ways, just let that flow out with the energy, depart from your body. Move from the joints in the hip out to the knee. There we have left energy in our hands and we can actually feel that energy if we bring it together. We can feel it intensify. And the joints and the knees have very specific energy configurations that allow knowing in a distance and things of that type. Very interesting energy. Some traditions use that energy in their practices. We just combine it here and let it gather all of the negativity, the darkness, any, any difficulty, any challenges in our life. Let it merge into that and let's move it on down the rest of the leg. 
down to the ankle. And when you get to the ankle again, very key energy for the body that has a lot to do with how we balance and how we are able to exist in the physical world. It's part of our grounding. And then on into the, the feet. And the feet have all the nerves in the body are expressed in the feet. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, foot massage and movements of that energy, breaking up of that energy can have huge effects on health and well being, help us to release and get those out of our body. And the first technique that we did, we were trying to simply become aware of the life force, the flow of that energy. The second technique, we were trying to direct our sense perception inwardly and go into the inner parts of our being, to the inner locations where there are centers of energy that we can, we can experience, we can feel, we can know directly the life force within our own body. And we go back to the top of the head with our breath, release everything into the earth. We offer a prayer of gratitude to the divine part of ourself, to the divine source that created all consciousness, all beings. Thank you for letting me be aware of the life force, for helping me to develop inner sense perception so that I can be aware of the subtle forces, the subtle energies that make up the body and the mind. And for the ability to release that energy and let it flow. And most healing traditions all try to get the flow of energy through the body, the flow of chi in balance and in harmony. And anytime that flow is blocked or disturbed or distorted, uh, it can cause illness or sickness within the body. So as you focus back and offer your gratitude, we sit there for just a moment now in silence. I again think of Audley. I hold his image in the mind and I hold the image of all of those that are participating in the same mind and the same awareness. Ask for his blessing, for his guidance to help us focus and understand the deeper parts of our own being. To help us release and clear the mind, to have the clear sight with the clear light. Just sit quietly and focus within your own being. And slowly come back into your physical awareness. Helps to move, uh, helps to rub the face a little bit sometimes. Stretch just in your chair or in your, where you're seated. Come back into what 
we would call physical consciousness or gross level consciousness. And then the, uh, the questions that I, I started with, um, if anyone has any, any comments, uh, any questions, we'll get in, into those as we go, but we can be interactive, dynamic, and uh, what we hope to do. I is have to... a question. Yes. Yes, Ben, uh, you mentioned during the run of the energy is that, um, that we can sense the chakras. How I can, I can sense um, the energy you know, like and the tingling in my hands is so powerful. Yeah. It's so, you know, um, but I haven't sensed the chakras in my system. It, it uh, uh, something that how you you sense that I don't I don't. It's it's just like the <laughs> centers. Yeah, the the centers in the hand or the there's a small center and a lot of drawings that you'll find in uh, in Buddhist art in particular, Tibetan tradition, some of the uh, the Hindu, but they'll always show uh, they'll often show a, a chakra or a point within the center of the hand. That's like a small version of what we would think of as the larger chakras. And I've just found over time that as I move down the spine, if I go very slowly, uh, I can actually sense the different levels and the different awareness. And as I uh, stop in the joints and uh, just feel the, the the flow or the awareness there, I ask my intuition, you know, like divine self, uh, as Audley would say, Papa, you know, he, he sometimes he would talk of it in a very loving and and direct way, but help me to understand what I'm sensing. And as I uh, went through some of the meditations and, uh, you know, I, Kevin, like Kevin and I were talking earlier about maybe we're, we're on the wrong path or we, you know, we're on a false path. And uh, there's a lot of uh, confusion, you know, and it's uh, in, in all the religious traditions. That's why we have all the different uh, religions, all the different teachings, all the different traditions. It's clear not everyone is having the same experience, but when you get uh, a clear state of mind, uh, often you can see what the the uh, differences are between them, how they're being, uh, how people are experiencing something and calling it one thing or being motivated to take action against others and then uh, in some cases, you can understand why and what kind of where the confusion is or, or what's the loss uh, there. But you can, you can sense those. And I just say, uh, you know, ask your divine self to guide you in your meditation. I always start, you know, I think of oddly, you know, please guide me, direct me. It's kind of like his prayer that, you know, or his poem. Uh, you know, divine self, guide me and help me to open my intuition so that I know the best way to become conscious of what I am. You know, and, and it uh, starts with a clear intention to, to uh, wake up, to know yourself, to be full conscious, uh, fully realized uh, of the self, of God, how, however you want to talk about it, and uh, do it in this lifetime. You know, and that's what all the traditions... Uh, you know, the, the more popular ones anyway, are making claims that you can do it quickly, that you can do it in a year or two, that you can do it in this lifetime. Uh, so uh, that's, what it, that's what it's about. And when, when I don't get the results that I want, you know, I just continue to go deeper. I work first always with my own intuition, with, with the guidance of the guru. And then uh, I explore the other traditions, you know, I I start searching on Google and I search on Amazon and I find books or texts that help me to understand these. And, and I find that my experiences are not, uh, are not different from what many others that have taken the time to document what's going on. Uh, it's very similar. Now, and so you can focus at any point and feel it. The, the one thing, the one caution probably is that if you sense those, you don't want to flow out those centers of energy. And sometimes that's a bit of a challenge if you have uh, issues in a chakra, or, you know, karmic baggage or uh, challenges that you're dealing with in, in your life. Uh, sometimes it's easy to go out, though. So you need to have, you know, focused control of the mind.
to do some of these things. They're not, they're typically not taught as beginning meditation techniques. They're more uh, advanced techniques or uh, techniques that can, can take you deeper into the meditation. But that's one of the things that I found is helpful. And there's other traditions that do a whole lot of work with activating those particular chakras or centers within all through the body just to see what they do. And uh, sometimes if you have knowledge of that uh, awareness, uh, you, can, you can find out what the, uh, when there's problems, when there's illness or when there's disease or uh, disruption, discord, you can actually understand what's causing that imbalance. And uh, sometimes you know what to do to, uh, to fix it or you ask your divine self, uh, you know, show me what, what I can best do to, to move through this problem. And, uh, you know, sometimes if, uh, if that's your constant prayer, uh, you'll be shown either information, you'll be told about a doctor, you'll be uh, told about a book, you'll find some way to actually uh, expand your consciousness and your awareness. D does that help at all? Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, and then when, as, as I've shown this slide many times, you know, I try to, to keep it as a, a, a focus for what I'm doing. And, and it's always to validate the, the teachings, you know, and it's, um, it's easy to become like uh, the question Kevin and I were talking about, how do you know it's the right path? Well, you, the only way you can know is you can test it. You can either believe it or you can test it with your own experience, with your own consciousness. And, um, uh, you know, is it uh, always I start with, you know, what is the information? What's the teaching? And then test it. Does it work? Exactly. You know, and if somebody uh, shows me a technique or tells me about it, or uh, if Audley gave me information, you know, first thing he'd do is say, now test it and tell me what you experience. And, you know, I'd go away and work on it for a few days and then come back and we'd talk about it. And I'd say, well, you know, you drew it like this, but I'm seeing it like this. And, and he'd say, oh yeah, he says, that, that's, uh, you should be seeing that. Or no, I don't know what you're seeing there. Let's uh, go in and look at it together. And we do, and we, we, but we'd come to uh, a better way to describe it or to, to share it. And then uh, one of the things he always was pushing uh, me to do was trying to uh, explain everything in, in the most current scientific, linguistic and religious terms, you know. But how do, you, how do you say this or how do you describe these inner experiences in a way that make it easier for people in this time and this culture uh, or this period of time uh, to, to relate to it? How can they relate to it? Because some of the, the uh, traditions go back thousands of years. And, uh, if you don't read the original language, then you have to figure out is the translations that you're reading any good? Uh, if they're if they're reasonably good, then you can apply it, but you have to go through a lot more effort. So putting it in in the current language, uh, in the current images, uh, in that's uh, consistent with the scientific information that's out there today, makes it easy, clear, and concise. And uh, try to improve diagrams, drawings, and um, increasingly, I, I've been fascinated uh, recently. Been uh, spending a lot of time studying the Tibetan Buddhist uh, traditions in probably greater depth than I have at any point in my life. And uh, one of the things that they often do is when you meet the guru, uh, you take a gift of some type. And that's always something that uh, if that hasn't come into your consciousness, you should contemplate on it, you should meditate on it, and, and know that when you, when you go to the guru or when you find the guru, uh, it's always you need a you need a gift, and there's uh, often in the Tibetan traditions they would give a gift of a of a mandala, or you know basically they'd say we'll draw the whole kingdom the way you see it and and uh, and share it. And uh, one of the the great masters in the Tibetan tradition, they were uh, he he had studied with this with his teacher for twelve years, and the teacher hadn't given him uh, given any empowerments or any initiations or. Um, you know, not even a whole lot of teaching. Sometimes he'd whack him, you know, if he's going the wrong way and stuff. But then one day they're walking in the desert and uh, he says, it's time, you know, I need to need to do this. And the guy knows immediately, I need the, I need the gift for the guru. And he, he had no idea what to do. Uh, he, he said, I have nothing here. And so he went within himself for just a second. And he said, you can make the mandala. Uh, he said, pee in the sand. 
and uh, and draw the the image of the kingdom with your urine and and that's all he had so that's what he did and he offered it to the guru and the guru picked up the hardened uh, surface and broke it over his head and then he was enlightened but uh, it just shows that you know always have that uh, supportive attitude and that giving of reverence and respect for the king and the teacher and that even though you have what you have may not be uh, may not be very much or worth very much if it's all you have then you you give that and that's the important thing is uh is giving all that you have to it and that's one of the things where i asked the question about do you have a meditation altar and uh and it may be very simple uh, what i've seen is that uh, guys tend to have very simple uh, often uh, sometimes even even crude or simple altars maybe just a picture of the uh, of the guru that they they meditate with sometimes a candle uh, sometimes a flower uh, i think here uh, women do the women that i know anyway do a much better job of, of making a, a more beautiful uh, space and and in some sense i would say have better better gifts and, and a deeper sense of knowing or respect or awareness for uh, what that inner part is and so they they arrange an altar that has uh, beautiful flowers they're always fresh it's always very clean it's it's very neat um, it's clean daily uh, it's like cleaning your mind you, know, if you don't clean and, and structure the altar and, and provide it with respect uh, that's you know issues that would be good to explore uh, with your own, within your own being but it, it's good to have a, a small altar or a small place where you meditate uh, consistently uh, and it it's also useful if it can be a place that's a little bit out of the way uh, so that it's not disturbed by other energies that you can build your own awareness and your own energy uh, in that and your own devotion so that when the body sits there uh, it knows this is it's time to go inside it's time to be one with the divine and if you really build a place build a, a small uh, altar a shrine uh, i know some people that even have a small building uh, that's external to their house it's in the backyard or somewhere and it's a, a place that they use only for their uh, their meditation practices and uh, and it you can build a, a very great energy there that when you just go and sit even if you're having a hard time it will pull you into that so um, knowing that and then uh, whatever however you can describe what you're experiencing and offer that uh, to the guru or the teacher or the teaching uh, you know and if you can draw and 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 uh, illustrate uh, graphically show it like oddly was was truly a master at being able to graphically show what he was experiencing on the inner levels some people don't draw very well but they're better able to describe it maybe in words and uh, you know they have a better facility in language rather than uh, hand-eye coordination needed to draw uh, images and translate images into you know medium that can be shared uh, they're able to uh, use the the mind to uh, create descriptions to create words and language that can be helpful so whatever you can do work at it seriously just like you would study um, a, a subject in school or as my daughter told me once you know it's just like you you never knew how hard you need to study until you have to renew your driver's license in another state and you have to take the the driving test again and you have to go through this book that is 160 pages that has all this information and you and they only ask the most uh insignificant arcane questions and try to, to try to uh, see if you really know the information and uh, this is the way you need to approach this you know it's a a way to to collect your own view your own awareness and to uh, to share it with others or with the divine only it doesn't matter what matters is that you use your mind your resources your ability uh, to do it and if you uh, there's no excuse even if you have nothing uh, you know there's still something around you that you can make uh, an offering or a gift from and often in uh, initiation uh, especially like in the kriya tradition it's uh, you always take a flower and take a, a fresh food or fruit 
uh, and offer that uh, to the guru. And it, that offering opens the heart and it, it, uh, it gives you access to the divine. And it's a way to do it respectfully and, uh, and offer the very best that you have uh, to the divine part of your own being. And then as we've gone through all this stuff, we've talked repeatedly about different stages of consciousness. And uh, I consider the stages are, are kind of like the information, knowing, knowing this, knowing what we are, and, and you have to uh, know it intellectually, you have to know it uh, viscerally, like in your gut, you know, you have to, to, to have a direct experience of what you are. And these are, are simple things. And, you know, it's just like you can go over them many times with the waking consciousness, the physical world, uh, the dream consciousness, the subtle, subtle realm, uh, the deep sleep, uh, no dreams, causal realm. Uh, but these are all the states that we, we all experience every day. Um, and if you don't experience them every day, like if you try to, to not sleep and stay up nonstop, uh, the the barriers between the realms, the consciousness, the, the way the brain is built, the way the body is built. Uh, if you don't sleep, all of a sudden toxins build up and you enter some of these realms in full consciousness. You know, you, uh, you begin to see things, you begin to hear things, all sorts of things with extended sleep deprivation. Uh, you just change the balance slightly of the, the chemicals in the body that are naturally there all the time. And, and, uh, and these states can get mixed up out of sync, out of rhythm. They find that many of the uh, issues that people have uh, in their life, uh, even things like bipolar disorder or uh, attention deficit, all those things are often tied to inconsistencies or challenges between these levels and, of awareness or levels of consciousness, in these, these realms. And um, once you get out of balance, the natural rhythms uh, of the body, the circadian rhythms, once those are out of balance, a lot of people get into all kinds of strange things. So sleeping restfully, restful deep sleep each day is important. Uh, you know, on average, eight hours, seven or eight hours seems to help the most. Um, if you can dream uh, and you have subtle realm awareness, uh, then it, uh, it makes it easy to explore that world. And that's the world. The subtle realm is what we're trying to explore in the meditative process. We, we're sitting here physically in our waking consciousness and we're, we're saying we want to do some exercise that help us experience the subtle realm. And if someone has the, the, a microphone open, you know, could we all make sure that we're muted? It'll make it less distracting for others. Thank you. But as you, uh, as you begin to practice the subtle realm experiences, that's what meditation is, is we're trying to develop a dreamlike consciousness or a subtle state of consciousness uh, that's tied to each of the, the chakras or the centers in the body. Each one of them is a world in itself. Uh, but at the same time, we're trying to learn to focus consciousness. And the subtle realm, we can, the mind there that we know uh, it simply is a sense organ that senses or perceives thoughts and we see the thoughts arise and we say no i don't see anything i don't nothing happens when i meditate but i sit there and i i struggle well what are you struggling about oh well i you know i keep thinking about that person that said you know i was wrong uh, or i keep thinking about that person that humiliated me in some way or that put me down and and, you know, and it triggered some shame that I have, and I don't even know what it's about. But uh, one, once you sit in meditation, it's often talked about being the grasshopper mind. Uh, the, it's, the mind has a natural state to just create thoughts. They arise, you view them, you hold on to some of them, some of them you really like, and you, uh, you lust after it. You want to be with that person. You want to have that pile of money. You have have greed, you want to collect it and hold it, but all those are the, the expressions of the subtle realm, the mind, and those ideas. And the correlation from that is whatever we hold in the mind long enough and with great enough intention or intensity, we actually create it. We we're beings that manifest things. Unfortunately, at this stage in 
evolution or development. We're not, we're not particularly good at manifesting things. Otherwise we would, uh, you know, create things that we couldn't handle. And that's easy to do. I know from experience and you can create things in the mind that uh, career wise or relationship wise, or, uh, you know, adventure, travel, different things that completely consume you. And you forget about, uh, you know, your family, you forget about where you were, you forget about what you're doing, what your obligations are. Um, you can get lost in them, but that's learning how the mind works. And in the, the deep sleep, uh, if you don't get deep sleep, you simply don't rest well. And that's a state where, you know, the uh, physiologically, we can measure all these things now and we know what the pulse needs to be at and the oxygen content and uh, how relaxed, how how paralyzed the body becomes. The natural uh, evolutionary wise, we were designed uh, as beings so that when we go to sleep, it paralyzes the body. And if you're good at sleeping uh, and you, you don't have stress and you you don't eat too much late in the day and you don't drink too much and all these things. And uh, when you go into the deep slate, uh, deep state, the, the body simply is paralyzed, everything except the eyes. And about every 90 minutes, the eyes become active and you enter a dream state and uh, you actually follow what's going on uh, in, the, in the other world. But the, uh, if everything's working right, your body is paralyzed, you don't move, you don't make noise. Um, and so the tiger doesn't find you and eat you. And so it's, uh, it's a little better. And then that fourth state, the Turiya, the pure awareness, no matter what state you're in, gross, subtle, deep sleep, whatever causal realm, uh, you're always aware that there's uh, some, some witness. There's some part of you that seems to know what the hell's going on. And, uh, you know, if you're in deep sleep and no dreams and, you know, I can come in and shake you uh, gently, maybe not violently, but gently, uh, you'll wake up and you'll say, oh, it's asleep. Or you can be having a dream and uh, you're screaming and yelling and the monsters are about to get you. And then you jerk and you wake, you wake up uh, sometimes in a very distraught state, but you think, oh my God, it was just a dream and you're relaxed. And then the physical consciousness, uh, we have our, our awareness here and uh, what the, the, the mystics or the saints or the, the ancient ones say is that when the waking up is just like in the gross realm, all of a sudden you come aware and you wake up and you realize that this whole thing was just an illusion or just a dream, just an awareness. But there's some part of you that that knows all that all the time. And you know, you experience it every day. Uh, and that fourth part, the fourth state, you know, the pure awareness, the witness, uh, non-dual manifestation of consciousness, uh, the God self, I man, you know, a lot of different ways to describe it. Uh, but that part is uh, is always there. And uh, you know, and you you seem to think, well. You know, I was having these really annoying thoughts and it hurt like hell in my heart and my life power and I was angry and I wanted to hit somebody and I wanted to do these things. Uh, but there's a part of you that's aware uh, that all these things are going on, that witness. And so you do that. And then the beyond the witness state, there is the merging with oneness. You know, and, and when, you, when you do that, the, the fifth state, Turiyatita, uh, I have thoughts, I have feelings, but I'm not either one of those. I have bodies, I'm not any of those. And uh, it's, it's an awareness at a level that is a, an awareness that you are all things. You're one with all, all beings, all consciousness. Uh, and when you get into that state, uh, it can be quite, quite beautiful and you know, touch you deeply. And then the, the path that we've talked about, there's, I often talk about the states of consciousness that we just described. Uh, the stages of consciousness that we, how we develop and, and how we go through it. And, and the guru or guru yoga, um, it's a, another map, but it's, it's the traditions, all of the traditions that I've been exposed to, uh, you know, they started with, with a guru, with, uh, with oddly and an awareness or a teaching. And I applied the teaching and it, it uh, worked quite well. And I kept doing it and stayed around until he wasn't there anymore. And then, um, you know, went to do the things I needed to do in my life. 
but uh, it's a very useful path. And from if you look at all the traditions in the world, all the different religious traditions, all of them have some version of that in the mystical tradition, uh, where that if you follow the teaching of, of one that has experienced it or has been there, uh, you can follow what they're saying and you can also experience that. And there's lots of different ways. And uh, it's oddly used to say there's as many ways to know God as there are people. Um, and, I, and I think that's pretty much from what my experience, that's, that's what I've seen. Um, and I, I've been fascinated in some of the, the Buddhist texts. You know, they talk about 84,000 different ways that, uh, that you can know God. And it's, there's, uh, each one of them has to do with some state or some center or some chakra or some, something within the body. Uh, there's these tubes of awareness, oddly called it like a, uh, a bundle of habits tied by a, or, or a, a bundle of memories tied by a string of habits. It's this bundle of memories. It's, they, they appear in, uh, when you get in and look at them deeply or from an inner perspective, a subtle realm perspective, they can appear to be tubes of awareness or tubes of energy. And they, um, and they all have energy within them. And if the energy is not flowing well, uh, it's one sort of uh, problem that will arise. If it's flowing too strongly, it's another. Uh, sorry, in lots of different ways. And some traditions talk about that being winds that flow as the life force flows through these, these tubes of memory or these tubes of awareness um, that, that we kind of record our life. Uh, there's you can experience that wind sometimes, you can feel it sometimes, you can hear it, but it's it's spread out in our normal waking consciousness through all the different channels or tubes. And some of the traditions work to bring all of that wind energy together into the central channel and into the awareness. In a sense, it's similar to what, what we do in the, the Kriya tradition, we bring consciousness together and we we control it under our own conscious energy flow, but a way um, to, to meditate. And then the, the path we've talked about this a lot of times uh, with Audley, uh, we got kind of two for one. You know, there was the path of the Holy Nam. It's a path of non-duality, saying that there's only one, one God, one awareness, one consciousness. And uh, when you get into that, everything, if you look back from it or experience back from it, it's not like you as a personality is looking back from it, but you're having that non-dual sense of, of being all things. And when you, when you experience that, um, it's, uh, you know, just like if you think of, of the guru, it's like every teacher that I look at, every, every person that I look at, if I hold my consciousness enough on his image, then I, I see that part within every being. And, uh, and so I know at one point I, I came to the realization that there's only, there's only one God, there's only one guru, and, uh, and it's expressing through all these forms. And sometimes it's forms I recognize and I've known in the past, or that sometimes it's forms that I've never seen before. But, uh, but it's a beautiful expression of that non-dual uh, reality. And the, the path of the holy nom, uh, the, the, probably the unique thing about that is that, uh, you know, there's a sound that emanates from the source um, as, as it uh, expresses. And that sound, if you follow that sound, you can go right back to the source. And uh, all of the religious traditions, all of the uh, meditation traditions, they in some way emulate or create that sound as part of the practice. And it's, it's the Om sound or the Amen. Um, it's expressed in Ah as Om, as Hum, expressed, it's heard by different people in different ways. It's like as the ears function slightly different in those and so they're perceived in different ways or as the energy flows through you, it activates some of the centers that uh, are within your brain and within your consciousness. And so you hear it from a particular point of view or expression. But if you go right into the source, you can follow any tradition. If you just contemplate and think about that when you go in, you can understand why they perceive it as they do and what part of the body is being activated or energized. And then in this path, the Holy Nam, you know, the key, key, key attributes are dedication, discipline, 
devotion, discrimination, and, and meditation. It's the internal focus. Uh, the discipline is, is controlling the mind, but it really also is controlling the mind with ethical living. You know, are you, are you being compassionate and serving others? Are you devoted to the divine self or to the guru or to those that you're serving? Uh, have you dedicated, and, and the dedication, it's, it's fascinating. It's, uh, the dedication is in a sense like making a vow you know, to yourself or to your divine self that you know, I, will, I will follow this path and I will test it and I'll see if it works and not test it in a critical way to tear it down and break it apart, but to test it and apply it and see if you get the results that are described by those who teach it. And if not, you know, it's respectfully try to understand why it's, a, you know, you talk to them, you understand it, and you may realize that uh, you, you had simply not been aware of some part uh, of the life. And then the key part of, of the path is uh, in the meditation is becoming aware of the life energy and then listening to the sound current and, and directing the sense perception inwardly. And that's the second part of the meditation. We really didn't, didn't get into that. We, we did the movement and the flow of energy uh, is what we did. And the, the second one we set in the stillness, it was to go over the mantra in your mind. And the mantra uh, is actually the expression of the sound current. If you get very quiet, that's pulsating and that's a part of what you are. And if you've been taken by a teacher into that that can show you that and connect you to that current, it can be present with you at all times and you can know it and be aware of it. And then um, the, the meditation, the, the, the text that uh, was put together for Audley's teaching, uh, and this is something that we're working on. Anybody that wants to work on it, uh, I'm trying to collect it and sort of rewrite the whole thing and uh, correct some of the errors that are in it and do things like that. But it, uh, it talks about in in the beginning meditation book, an introduction, you know, it gives basic elements essential to awakening consciousness. And it talks about man or consciousness, woman, uh, in that sense, meditation, what is it? There's a description of that. Uh, conscious work on yourself, first step, self-analysis. You know, just like as you begin to, to make changes or to see things differently, or you make a commitment, you dedicate yourself to know the self, uh, you, a lot of times you need to look at the habits that you have in the mind and the habits in the mind. We typically have just a few favorite habits and we think about it and go over it and we, uh, we go over it and over it and over it and every day. Somehow or another, we feel even a sense of importance and knowing that, you know, I've got my, my own sense of uh, habits and I'm in control of them. And I can, I can think about, uh, ah, beautiful people. I can think about ah, deep knowledge, ah, great, great sums of money or great uh, assets. You know, it's just like, where's your consciousness focus? And first you do self-analysis and you understand where it's focused. And then you uh, begin to, to make changes. And a lot of the meditation techniques are simply how to help you change the way that you're focusing today because the focus often leads one to suffering or to misery. Um, it distracts in such a way that you don't find peace or happiness. And so unless you change some of the things that are in the mind and uh, put new things in, that's the easiest way to change them. Uh, that's what you do. And the, the meditation techniques are simply to help you move past this outer world awareness and to build the relationship with the the teacher, the guru within. Uh, so it's a useful path. Uh, and one, one thing that Audley often said, and he even handed out in the early years a paper uh, when you came in, and this was one of the, the key points in it, to walk in truth, I must be honest, courageous, and adaptable to my environment. And, and I pull that out from the whole section just because I think it's, it's very important to be honest uh, with those around you, but most importantly, honestly, with yourself, uh, to have the courage to look at the issues that you have and to change them, the courage sometimes to change it, and then be adaptable to the environment. It's when I find, uh, I talk with people and counsel people, uh, often the, the biggest challenge is the lack of adaptability to the environment. 
You know, it's just like uh, the environment's going one way and they're going another. You know, they lost their job and uh, they uh, don't know what they're going to do for food or paying the rent. Well, you know, and, and they often then throw in, you can, you know, understand and just to oddly always said, you know, just let a person talk for two, two to five minutes and you can understand all their motivation. And, uh, you know, if they, if they start with something like that and then they, they'll give you a list of all the reasons why they're not able to solve the problem. You know, I'm, I'm an old person and they don't hire old people. Um, you know, I'm not tall enough. I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm overweight, you know, they've just got a lot of reasons. Uh, I'm not attractive enough, you know, for, for the job or whatever, or I don't have enough education or intelligence or, you know, even natural skill. Uh, but uh, all of those, uh, you, you can find out very quickly, uh, just asking a few questions. Uh, is the person being honest with themselves? Do they have the courage to face the issues and change them? And then can they be adaptable? You know, it's just like, uh, there's some jobs that just go away and that's happened a number of times in the history of, of humanity. You know, there was one point where uh, they needed horses to plow fields and it took a, a lot of people to take care of the horses, uh, people to make the harness, to make the plows that could be pulled by the horse, to generate the food that could be eaten by the horses so that the stronger horse could, could pull and do that. And then all of a sudden, they, somebody invented the damn tractor and not only did they not need the horses, but they didn't need any of the people that had those skills to do those things. And so um, you can give up at that point or you can say, ah, oh, I can be adaptable. I can learn new skills. Now I can fix tractors, uh, do things of that type. But it's um, to walk in truth. It's important to be honest, courageous and adaptable. Uh, and then the, the Kriya yoga path, also a path of non-duality. And, and uh, sometimes uh, people, uh, don't seem to catch the the concept of non-duality that there's there's not uh, you know two, there's not a mind and a body and or there's not uh, you and the the guru there's not you and the the self you and the divine uh, there's simply this is it I mean the whole thing and your consciousness you're sitting here uh, experiencing all of reality uh, at least all of it that you can can see at this point and there is no other. And as you contemplate that and understand uh, that this is an expression and, and it, it's an, an expression that can know itself, but there's, there's not this and that, you know, there's only, only this. But in, in Kriya, the, uh, that signifies purification or action. Um, and its key parts are contemplation, study, uh, meditation and prayer, uh, cultivation of virtues, again, the self-discipline. Uh, the being honest, uh, being clean, uh, offering respect, just like your altar, those things, and then surrender the sense of separate existence. Um, we get into this world, and at this stage in our culture and our time, uh, we all somehow or another end up thinking that we're these physical bodies, and that this this body, you know, needs a job doing this, or this body needs, uh, you know, funds to retire and travel and this body needs all those things. And we, we think this is what we are, this physical form. Um, but it really is the, the very bottom of what we are, you know, in, in a sense, you know, it's the, it's the dregs, it's the, the sense organs uh, is what the body, the, the body is created so that you can have the sense organs and the life force flows through it. And, and that manifests or expresses as consciousness. And so that's why learning to be conscious at any of the inflection points or crossover points or chakras or uh, centers of energy within the body. All of those helps you to loosen the awareness uh, and attachment to the physical form. You realize that you're something other than the physical body. There's a, a subtle component to yourself. And in that, once you develop some awareness and mastery in that subtle realm uh, you can begin to experience the world in a whole, a whole new way. So it can be a lot of fun. And then in the, the Buddhist teachings, uh, Buddhism developed over time and, and like each of the teaching have, but there's the history of it's probably been defined a little better, but it's also uh, the, the most advanced uh, teachings are, are non-dualistic um, teaching also. And 
there's two general traditions and and i i do these because it's a little better defined uh to to approach it in this way than than maybe our own tradition and, and like as we uh work to to i guess create or collect audley's legacy in that it's to uh, one one approach to that just simply collect all the stuff that uh he wrote or somebody wrote down that he wrote or you know like the notes the awareness the lectures um you know it's just like collect just that or you can you know collect it and synthesize it can can i pull out the key the key parts and can i make those more clear so it's easy to understand so uh, someone can listen to you know a few hundred or a few thousand hours of lectures um read notes that uh, are from various people and uh you know and, and kind of get a sense for what he was teaching uh, or is there a way to to shorten it and make it more concise nearly all of the teachings as they develop historically uh, there's at first the explosion of a lot of uh, just broad general information and then there's others that as they study it they pull out the key parts and they find that they practice those and then if you want to teach it uh, you try to make it as clear and concise and uh, make it as easy as possible and the sutra yana or the sutras the written text um, for study and contemplation that's what many of the traditions are and even in the buddhist traditions the historically you studied sutra for about 20 years and then if you had done a really good job uh, and you had mastered all of the information conceptual and philosophical and were able to debate it uh, fiercely with with others if you had transitioned through that then they taught you meditation uh, but some of the later teachings came out, uh, really the ninth to the 12th century, I think those were began to emerge in, in many of the traditions around the world. And the Buddhists called it the Tantrayana or the, the knowing by direct experience. And that was simply teaching meditation and teaching a lot of the different techniques of meditation and a lot of different ways to resolve particular blockages or issues in the body or to expand consciousness. And uh, in those teachings, um, the Sutrayana, it's, it's a Sanskrit term, but it's an Indo-Tibetan. Uh, it has kind of a threefold classification of the yanas. Uh, a yana is a, a practice that leads to realization of emptiness, and uh, emptiness is the same as uh, in the Kriya tradition or in the, in the Holy Nam. Uh, we generally don't talk about it being emptiness, but we talk about it being oneness, and we talk about the fact that uh, when we merge into that, uh, there's not the personality self, the ego self is not there. Uh, it's, it's simply awareness of consciousness itself. And uh, the three yanas that developed in the sutra yana, the, the Theravada and the Mahayana and the Vajrayana, uh, different traditions, uh, but the uh, developed historically and are prevalent in different parts or different countries of the world today. Uh, but the one that uh, has seemed to be driving probably the greatest interest in literature and things today is the Vajrayana, uh, and that has the Tantrayana and the, uh, the Dokjin or the, the meditation techniques, the inner, the inner awareness. And some of these techniques go back a long way throughout time, but uh, they're key parts of understanding the realization and understanding the meditative process. And uh, to to meditate, uh, having good instruction, having clear instruction, uh, having someone that can take you through it in a guided format uh, is often the way that people start. And then in time, you begin to practice by yourself. And that's where the true practice comes in as you begin to explore your own mind. And, and you can move to a place in consciousness where it becomes steady and still and you can actually watch the individual thoughts arise in your mind. Uh, you can feed them and, uh, you know, make them more intense, more aware, more frightening, more beautiful, or you can uh, simply uh, relax and let that thought, if you don't feed it, don't provide additional consciousness, awareness, and energy to it, the thought will simply fade away and another one will rise. And it's a constant process in the mind field of thoughts arising. And the longer you uh, sit and watch them if you begin to let them not feed them with energy, but let them dissolve uh, in time, they become less and less frequent. And then 
when thoughts no longer arise in the mind, then you, you see that's what the Buddhists call the emptiness. You see the emptiness of thought, emptiness of the mind, uh, emptiness of the concept of the self, of, uh, of the ego, of the awareness. And simply, there's, there's, no, there's no, nothing that you can find inside yourself that's this magical uh, being that's what you are. You know, it's, it's like it's, uh, there, there is not that. There is consciousness expressing and you can have an awareness of it. That's the, that's the intent. And then uh, affirmatively declare, and this is a quote from Roy Davis, uh, without hesitation, I choose to be self and God realized in my current incarnation. From this moment forward, I will discipline my thoughts and behaviors, profoundly study to acquire accurate knowledge of higher realities, meditate super consciously, and allow my innate qualities and capacities to be fully actualized. And uh, that's a nice intention uh, to, to go into. And, and as you have a small altar, uh, having some of these intentions are like the prayer from Audley or the image of the teacher, uh, but having some way to focus the mind is an ideal way to enter into the meditative state and the meditative process. And I think, uh, you know, that's probably a good place to say, okay, let's, let's take a break and, uh, or let's uh, look at the, look at the guru and, uh, when you, as you do meditate, you know, the thing I found in it, oddly, I think he was, he was a little shy about it. You know, he, he, he was, uh, he was not self-promoting, you know, he was very much, so he would talk about, you know, how he had meditated on Dr. Thin. And uh, as I got to know him much better and deeper in the uh, early years, uh, you know, he showed me uh, a, a, a nice box that he had built uh, in his meditation room, and it had a picture of Dr. Thin that was uh, unfortunately much more clear than this. It was more clear than this, but he had uh, taken a, a fine point and uh, had, it was a light box and uh, it was a, a negative uh, that he had, had processed and up from a picture he had taken and uh, he had removed just a small uh, or made a small hole in the eyes so that the light from the light box could shine through. And I've tried to simulate that. I've tried lots of different ways over time, but to create uh, his image that has more light in the eyes. And it's, uh, it's a, been a useful tool for me and I'll post these things so people, people can do them, um, utilize them. And uh, maybe just, I'll go through these just a second and then we can take a break if we need it. But I've got the, the two versions, uh, and these are ones that I often practice with and in, um, in developing my concentration to cross the eyes. And it was techniques that he found uh, were particularly useful to generate concentration and focus. And I'll talk about more of that in the next lecture, but uh, pull those images together as the, the eyes cross and you see a third image that will appear uh, between them. And it uh, amazingly gets much more clear and much more aware and uh, it's very helpful uh, in the meditative process uh, for me. And then uh, I use the similar technique for some of the other images and uh, it simply gives a, a better point for the mind to focus and uh, is, can be useful. And then another thing that uh, some of the uh, Tibetan techniques in particular uh, are, are very good at is if you look at these pictures and I, again, I use two images a lot of times just to improve concentration, but, um, but I've uh, adjusted these images so that they have, um, if you look, you know, into the heart or you look into the crown chakra, or you look into what uh, is often referred to as the Buddha, um, his image is in there. And uh, this is a uh, techniques that are often used to, to bring the consciousness of the guru into the form, into the body and become one, uh, with that and what what the goal in the whole meditative process is to become one with the the uh, the guru and the true guru is the the inner self the divine the divine god self the divine awareness uh, and that's that's a formless state but it, at, at every level you know it's just like I work to see his image his awareness his consciousness and uh, the Tibetans say you know the first thing you do is 
uh, you set your intent to be one with that. And so you, you become, you become that. And they have a lot of the meditative techniques to where you become the, the, uh, the guru, or you become the, they refer to it as the yidam or the, the deity, uh, the, the representation of the divine self expressing in the world. And you concentrate on those images or on those uh, forms and you become that. You become the divine self. You become oddly. You become the, the, the divine part of your own being and such an awareness that, you know, everywhere you look, you, you see that, that awareness and that concentration, uh, that consciousness. I think I'll just, I'll, I'll stop here and then we can, uh, if, if you need to take a break, go ahead and, you know, take a break. If you have questions, um, you know, please ask your questions and I'll try to, uh, try to respond and answer those in a positive and uh, correct way. Does that make sense? Yes. And I have a question. Ben. Yes. You know, um, one was talking earlier about feeling the consciousness at the chakras um, in the spine. Yes. And we've talked earlier in, I don't know, a, a couple of times ago about when um, the order of the, of the chakras in different traditions, they're the heart and the life power reversed or that kind of thing. Yeah. And so it seems a little subjective uh, as to who uh, perceives them in one way or another. So I guess my question is, um, to what extent do we um, create the, the chakra in a certain location just by uh, building it, uh, building attention, building our perception there? And then through repetition, it multiplies and it becomes in that location. Is that possible or does that occur? Yeah, it, it, it looks like, you know, as I look at, uh, at my own consciousness, my own awareness, my own chakra system, uh, you know, I see one thing. And then as I, I look at others, uh, you know, I, I see uh, different things. And, you know, I see everybody as, as, as unique as their face is. You know, it's just like everybody, they come in different sizes. They come in, you know, in thin and, and big and, you know, and, and tall and short. And, um, and they all look uh, enough different that even though it, it seems like very subtle differences, my eye can pick out in a, in a minute, you know, who, who's, who's, who's who. And, you know, you recognize the faces you've seen before and stuff like that. But um, as we express in consciousness, we all have that expression and, and it seems to be fairly unique to each one of us. And that's why, uh, you know, when you look at a teaching and a, and a teacher, like some of them say, there's not a common path for everybody. You know, they, there are some traditions that I know that they, they simply do not offer a common path, you know, unless you sit with a knowledgeable teacher, a guru, a, a Lama, a Rinpoche, you know, one of those, one of these guys that, that knows and, and he can assess, you know, kind of where, how you're expressing. And then they can say, oh yeah, you got a couple of blockages here. You got a, got a few fixations there and that, and, and you correct those. And then it seems like there is a, a nominal uh, placement or, you know, if everything is functioning fine, you know, it's just like you can tell this is a healthy person and the chakras in them tend to be more consistently in line and in the same places and, and often in the same colors. But the, the color that is expressed through the chakra. Uh, like I, I had an interesting discussion the other day. Uh, one of the people uh, said the, the color, they, they were real concerned because Audley's picture shows the heart is yellow and that doesn't follow the rainbow. And for some reason, there's a real interest to, to follow the spectrum of light, you know, and if it's not that, then it must not be a true teaching. And like, what did he know? But then you go back and you look at the other other te teachings and other traditions and you find that it's different, you know, in all kinds of ways. And, and when I, you know, have discussions like that, I, it triggers me to want to go and look and say, okay, what's the real, 
you know, why is it different? Why do I see it yellow and why some see it green and some people see the heart is red? And you know, what's, what's the big deal? And, and that was one of the things that as I got into that and, and uh, you know, I think one of the texts of Ken Wilbur was very helpful there in, uh, in saying that as the energy expresses in the gross, the subtle and the, the causal realms and even the, the wide variation in the, in the subtle realm, as those uh, express, the colors that are most dominant in that particular expression are what show in the, in the chakra. So, okay, I, 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 at least to my satisfaction, was able to understand it in a way to say, okay, there can be lots of differences. They can be all over the place. Like I've seen people that have, have one chakra that's either very large and oversized. And, you know, I'm always curious, is this a, is this a, a problem? or something they develop, maybe it's a talent, it's a skill, it's a, an addiction, you know, what is it? But uh, bringing those into a consistent balance, um, you know, and, and if I don't know, I just ask the divine self, you know, help me to understand what this is. But, but you get a sense for, for what it is and for how it can express. And yeah, we, we determine what we look like in those subtle realms by the way we live. Maybe that's the best way to say it. And yeah, it, uh, you're different. Of, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead in a lot of the exercises where we were instructed to go to a certain place um, and then do something, it was sort of like, well, ask your divine self for help and act as if you're there and right. your intent will get you to the right place and, right. and then just go with it. And yeah. to me, it's like, well, okay, so your intent builds performance at that location, which means that I'm actually creating it and building it there. So it's, it's kind of my intent that's doing it. Yeah. Um, I don't know. And there is a component of that, but there, there does appear to be an underlying structure. You know, it's just like all, all humans, you know, if they're reasonably healthy, they have five fingers and five toes and, and, you know, and there's the heads on top, you know, it's, it doesn't, uh, you know, you rarely find, you know, distortions of where it comes out on the bottom or out on, on the left foot or, uh, you know, things like that. I mean, there are underlying structures in how, as the energy flows and how it expresses in the world, but you can distort that flow and, you know, it, it causes anomalies or, or even just subtle differences in, in the color and the shape uh, in the size uh, of the chakra, you know, like I, I've seen, I've seen, uh, I guess, two different people that had a very small heart chakra. You know, it's just like it was where normal, normal stuff, you know, you, you kind of get used to seeing people when you're into that state, but the, the heart was as small as a marble, you know, just a very, very small. And I, and I think, you know, what, what the hell is this, you know? And, and, uh, and when, I, when I see something that I would consider an anomaly, you know, it's, I usually just observe, you know, I, I watch and try to, try to see, see what's going on and see what's happening. And then uh, like I saw one person one time and, and the life force was so, so depleted that there was barely any, it looked as, unless I looked carefully, there was no life, for, no life source or no life, life force in their body. Wow. You know, and, 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 uh, and they were near death. You know, just like I, I didn't realize at the time until I observed a person dying, I didn't realize that, you know, I saw someone that was, was right near their end and they, you know, were traveling. I, I saw them on a, I was, had arrived in Boston and went on the rental car bus and I looked up and here's this lady with no life force in the body. And, wow. and when, you, when you see that at first, you know, it's just like, oh shit, what's this? And then, you know, you ask the divine self and try to observe and and then all, all you can do in a situation like that is you offer a blessing, you know, you just say, you know, may the divine part of your own being help you to transition appropriately. But yeah, we have a, we do have a big influence on what, what appears we, and our intention creates it and, uh, and manifest, but there are structures that it can be done with. And then we can change those, you know, we can change our habit. And as you change your habits, uh, you change your, uh, your awareness. And uh, I, I often like, uh, in I don't know if you're familiar with the teachings of Carlos Castaneda, Don Juan, and that, but he talked about, uh, you know, like we have this shell of energy called it an egg, you know, and, and that normal people have two parts in the egg, the upper and the lower. And then there's these uh, certain beings that have uh, multiple parts, 
you know, they, they, and they become uh, simply the energetic configuration uh, because it's different. They have a different depth of awareness and uh, the, some people have four parts divided and they're, they become a Nagual or a, a teacher in that they always collect a group that their energetic awareness allows them to see different things. And then like, you know, he points out to Carlos, you know, we, we didn't know what to do with you. You only have three, three versions, three parts uh, in, in your egg. And the net result of that is that he said, you know, you're going to be unique, either a the end of our, the destruction of our line of teaching or, or the, the one that, that opens it to the public. And, you know, he ended up, you know, writing documents that shared some of that knowledge uh, with the world. So very, very useful, very interesting. But, but in his tradition that we had the egg, but he said all of the, uh, you know, the consciousness was a bright spot on the, the back portion of the egg, usually above the right shoulder. And they called it the assemblage point. And it described, the way it's described, it's very much like Audley's, you know, a bundle of memories tied by a string of habits. You're taught as a child where to, how to view the world and you get this world view and you get this view of I'm a person in the world and I live in Oklahoma City or I live in, you know, California or whatever, but that has to do with the position of that light on, on the egg of energy. And I've looked at that and find that, yeah, sure enough, it, it's, uh, it is an interesting way to describe it and it does uh, help it's very useful to understand how some people express an energy because that, that uh, point of light, that point of consciousness, that focus can be at different points on the egg and you see a different world wherever that's focused. Uh, so that's why studying all traditions, there's some truth in them. Maybe not, may not be all correct, but you can study it and get some awareness. Okay, that, does that make sense? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Ben, I have a question. Hey, yeah. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. I have a question too. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mary. Well, uh, I, I last night I dreamt of Audley, um, and when I do that, I always wonder, well, was that really him? So I want to know, Ben, what what you look for when you dream of him. Um. When I dream or see in meditation, uh, one thing I've found is that something, uh, you know, because he's the, you know, the super guru, uh, you know, in my mind, there's only one guru and doesn't matter, doesn't matter what his name might be. It could be Jesus. It could be Buddha. It could be anything. There's only one. And it's, you know, in, in my life experience, it's oddly. I've, I've never seen any other form be able to utilize his form you know it's just like it has enough self-awareness or self-consciousness or enough enough i guess intensity of what it is that uh in his expression at the the level that he expresses from uh that it it uh it it comes through if it's there i i i don't doubt it you know and it, and it comes through with that knowing but uh you know it's just like um, at one point I thought, you know, there's some, something's playing with the image and trying to tell me stuff that's not right and, uh, and things like that. So I, I immediately look at myself and say, wow, the things that even though they were unpleasant, I didn't really want to hear them. They are right, <laughs> you know, and I need to get my shit together <laughs> kind of stuff. Uh -oh. but, uh, but what I look for, you know, it's just like, it, it's not, uh, anymore. It's, it's not oddly the personality. But it's, right. it's that awareness and that presence and that compassion is probably the greatest thing I found is that that total compassion or that total acceptance um, and, and knowing of, uh, I guess, how he, he related, that, that relationship is still there. He is somewhat... Uh, you know, he, he talked about like in his next life, he wanted to have a stronger chin and he wanted to be a firmer, you know, and I mean, he, he was kind of creating his next form but by the way you live. But I, but I see that, you know, he expresses his, his true being or his, his true awareness at that, uh, as it first comes out of the causal, it, there is a resemblance and there's that feeling, but what is most aware is that compassion and that acceptance. 
and uh, and and then then the knowing, you know, if it's just like if I if I ask a question or surrender to that, you know, it's just like I have that. But it's it's hard to sort out because it's like I you know have images of him all around me and uh, on my computer, on my phone, on the wall, and uh, every room. And, yeah, every room kind of thing, <laughs> you know, in uh, in the car. And then when when I do my meditative practices, you know, I just I work to see his image and. And all the centers so i'm not surprised that i see it in dreams and that and i know that uh you know occasionally people uh describe something that uh you know it sounds sort of like oddly but it but it, it doesn't exactly and and uh, you know and it i i always you know if they begin to ask questions in that you know look and and see well is it uh you know how is it expressing how is it treating you how is it responding uh, you know, in, in the image and are, are you filled up when you, when you get through it or do you feel depleted in some way? You know, there's a lot of ways to sort it out if you want to test. And I, and I encourage, you know, everybody to, to test everything. You know, it's just like we, right. we're in a world of the mind and, and thoughts can be projected in it. But, um, you know, he's, um, I've seen a few beings, you know, like, the, like Baba G, same way. It's like I, I haven't seen anybody impersonate Baba G. You know, and I haven't seen anybody impersonate oddly. So I'm pretty confident with those, but I'd always say, you know, keep your aware, be, be respectful, but keep your awareness, you know, keep your, your own uh, sensitivity. And then, you know, if it's what you think it is, then merge with it, you know, 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 know it to the core, know it as a part of what you are. And, and when you get deep enough into it, you know, it's just like, you, you're that. It's not, it's not, he's separate and, you know, you're here and I'm there and you know and all that. It's just like, wow, I'm not sure how this works, but it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> but then hopefully that helps a little. Yes. Okay. Yeah. My question, Ben, was also related to sleep and dreams. The other day I was I was sleeping and then I heard somebody calling my name and it woke me up. Yeah. That's, uh... And I wasn't sure what. You know, but it was so clear and so that it woke me up. So I wasn't sure what it, where it came from. Um, when the a, a number of the many of the traditions talk about that when when they, they talk about it in uh, uh, I think uh, I like the way uh, Don Juan described it to Carlos. He says the spirit comes to every man or every woman at least three times in their life. And, uh, and when the spirit comes, it, it often calls your name or, you know, it activates your consciousness in a way that attracts you and makes you want to know more about it. And uh, a lot of times it's the first time it comes, it, it, uh, it's very powerful and it's overwhelming. And, and some people hear that call, like that was one of the things I, I heard, heard oddly call my name once in a, in a dream before I met him. You know, to, but I knew his voice. You know, that's how I knew he was my teacher when I first saw him. It's just like that was the voice. Wow. Um, but then uh, sometimes, you know, if you're if you're going the wrong way or you have a deep yearning or a deep question, the spirit will reach out to you and it, it will it will speak your name. And uh, and again, if it if it comes in that way, I always am, I'm, I'm probably more cautious. You know, it's just like okay you know, I'm here, you know, how can I be of service? You know, how can I, how can I help? And if, if the spirit or the uh, consciousness doesn't reveal itself, you know, I, I leave it alone. You know, it's just like, it's, it, maybe it's something that's trying to just attack, attract my attention. Uh, but if I, if I ask, you know, like if it's oddly, you know, or, or is, you know, it's just like, how, how can I, can I know, can you make this clear for me? Usually I see what it is, and sometimes it's someone in need that uh, that I'm close to, and you know, and they're they're very stressed, and they're they're calling out, you know, in a sense asking for help, and because I have some of that ability developed to to hear sounds in that way, you know, I'll hear them even though they might be thousands of miles away, and it could be something like that, but um, I would explore it, and, and more intently, I would, uh, or more importantly, I would explore the feeling that it left you with. You know, did it did it make you want to know something deeper about yourself, or was there has there been some question that you've been asking 
over and over and uh and you know and, and it's it's leading you or touching you with energy in a way that helps you to understand what that is and and then like in the christian tradition they often refer to it as the calling you know and it's just simply that um and there's in fact i have a friend uh dr julia mossbridge and uh she has written a book called the calling and it's just a whole little structured technique to go through and try to identify what you're calling or your what what you are most harmonious with in doing in your life or career or relationships and uh, you know it's like a self-help guide in a way but it takes you through a number of exercises to simply understand what that voice is saying to you and uh, you know and if it continues to happen i'd suggest you get a little you know it's just a, it's a real simple guide but it's a very useful guide and i've ref referred a number of people to it and and uh and they go through it and go through the little techniques and exercises and it and it helps what was that book it's called Could the calling dr julia mossbridge you know and it is the his name you can get it on amazon it's, uh, it's, it's small text but uh you know, very useful. And she has an online version on, on something she does, you know, teaching, but is a scientist does a lot of research. What's, the, what's her name again, please? Julia Mossbridge, M-O-S-S-B-R-I-D-G-E. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but useful, useful text. And I find a lot of people, you know, they just simply, their feeling is, I, I don't know what I need to do. And I spent most of my life in that. Uh, in that place now I'm pretty much at a place I know what I need to do you know and one of those things is do lectures <laughs> yay you know share what I'm experiencing <clears throat> you know, my, my perspective and you know it helps somebody that's good nothing else it definitely helps me uh, go deeper into myself that's why I think uh it's important for people to share and teach and you know uh, if you can't if you're if you experience it and aren't able to describe it uh, it, it doesn't have the reality or the the true realness that that you would like and uh, you know if you are been practicing meditation many many years and you don't feel you're making progress one of the best ways to do it is try to organize a lecture just you know how to meditate teach someone you know share it in some way because when you do that it opens up parts of you but it also uh, opens up parts of them and as they begin to ask questions uh, the divine self is very good about bringing the right people to me to ask the questions that help me to go deeper into myself so in a sense, oddly always said, be wisely selfish, you know, but in, in a sense, that, that's what it is. I mean, you, you give, give service and you give the best that you possibly can in a sense as an offering or as a, you know, a blessing to the divine. And, uh, and that opens, opens many doorways within your own consciousness. Any other questions? Well, if, uh, if there's no other questions, I think we're time-wise about as far as we, we need to go. <laughs> and uh, I, I appreciate everybody joining and uh, I appreciate the questions and uh, simply the continued interest in these topics and uh, look forward to doing more of them. Uh, one thing, uh, I did have some, uh, some of the lectures listed for uh, the next, uh, later, I guess, in the summer on the uh, Dr. Thin's work, Radiant Road to Reality. And uh, I've been trying to get a hold of David Thin, Dr. Thin's son, and uh, to talk with him and, you know, make sure we were clear about some of the things. Uh, but I will uh, do that series of lectures and uh, got his phone number and, and uh, email contacts and everything. The stuff I had was no longer um, active. And uh, Jim Strunk was, uh, had talked with him recently and uh, he encouraged me to call, but I, uh, as we go through that, one of the things I'd like to, to do is uh, have everybody uh, read the Radiant Road to Reality, uh, the, the text uh, that Dr. Thin wrote. And uh, from my perspective, it was clearly 
one of the best of his work. And uh, we'll go through that in a lot of detail, uh, kind of, you know, line by line in a, in a sense to understand uh, what, uh, what the basis was that he taught oddly and, and how that opened up into uh, where we are in our consciousness. But I'd like to, uh, to bring that uh, to life in a way, you know, and, and start putting it back out there also. A lot of the stuff uh, that related on, on Dr. Thin's website uh, to Audley was all removed and stuff. And we're going to try to figure out some way to, to uh, put that back in a way that uh, is supportive of, of all the teaching and supportive of Dr. Thin and of Audley also. Uh, so uh, if you don't have a copy of it, you can get it on Amazon or you can get it through Dr. Thin's site, I think Dr. Bagatsingthin.com. And I think it takes you to Amazon to buy it. But I uh, would encourage you to get that and begin to read it. But we'll go through every chapter in, in quite a bit of detail and uh, try to make some sense of it and, and see if we can learn learn maybe a, a deeper or better way to apply it to our lives. And uh, if you're teaching or sharing, it uh, gives you uh, a broader base of the, the roots of our, of our techniques and uh, traditions. And then also in the, the series is uh, uh, some uh, lectures uh, regarding the- uh, I'm not sure I understand. Oh, I, I got too close to saying Siri. <laughs> 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 she doesn't understand. It's like I know, <laughs> you know. But, uh, the uh, there are several texts that uh, are useful uh, in the Kriya tradition. Probably the the best is the uh, the Yoga Sutras, and uh, it's again a short a short text. And and uh, I'll do a, a series of lectures around those because they have a lot of information that uh, help to put perspective on what we experience as we go into meditation. And then uh, I, I throw out a lot of these question things that, uh, that people look at, but I'm, I'm really curious and uh, I'm considering uh, putting some type of survey together so that I can collect more information about the type of meditation that people are doing, um, how long, you know, what, how long they're meditating each day and stuff like that. I'm curious to see uh, in, in some extent how the students of Audley, how, you know, how they're practicing. And, uh, and can we understand and learn something from that? You know, it's just like people that are practicing and having deep inner experiences, maybe we can learn something, you know? And, and uh, you know, there's some parts that, you know, I could get pretty clear, some parts I'm still confused about. So it, for me, it helps to interact with others and, you know, learn more. Anyway, that's about all I have. Uh, if there's no questions, we can sign off at this point. And, I just say have a have a good week, a couple of weeks, and we'll be back and talk about concentration and uh, how to develop that. And it'll be a little more practice oriented, um, and uh, and do that. But um, I'll, I'll like to finish with one little story that I, I read uh, this week, and uh, it was in trying to understand uh, what we are in consciousness. And there's a lot of things that arise that. Uh, simply arise and are in our awareness, but then dissipate. And one of the, the teacher that I was listening to, he, he used an example that I found very, very helpful. But he, like if you, if you take the the, a candle and you place it uh, in front of you and you, you light the candle and you begin to meditate uh, on that, uh, one of the things that you notice is that over time the candle disappears. You know, and it, you know, we say it burns down, you know, it, the wax melts, it turns it in, you know, there's a whole chemical process that, that it does it. But the flame, uh, as long as there's fuel, the, the flame stays. Uh, but it, the flame simply arises from, uh, you know, it's a combination of chemicals and energy and all that stuff. But the flame arises out of the, the form. And it's just like in our consciousness, often consciousness or the spirit is, is represented as the flame or the wind, the parts that we, that don't have substance to them that we don't see uh, so much, but the, the flame arises as long as it's fueled and as long as it's energized. And this is kind of how the process in the mind, as you, as you apply fuel to it, whether it be uh, melted wax at, at a certain temperature or, 
or simply you keep thinking that thought over and over like, oh my God, I, that person, you know, really wronged me and they, you know, I, I loaned them that money and they never paid it back. You know, and you can go over and over and I see people get totally consumed in those things to where uh, they forget almost everything else in their life and, and uh, they, they get lost in, in feeding that flame. And the more they feed it and the more they go over it, the brighter it gets and to the point that sometimes they do things that they wish they hadn't have done. Uh, but but the, the key part to look at is the, the flame or the thought arises uh, as long as we feed it and we feed it fuel. And if we quit feeding it fuel, it dies out completely and it vanishes. And there's transitions in states of consciousness. Like when, when you light the candle, uh, you can utilize the flame for concentration and for awareness. And, uh, and if you become very still, the flame becomes very still and very stable. And that's what you want to do with your mind. And then as it becomes very stable, uh, if you withdraw the energy from it, then it, the, the flame goes out or disappears or uh, dies. But it's, it's a good way to think of the thoughts and just realize that as you go into meditation, if you have thoughts that are bothering you a great deal, uh, if you realize that, uh, begin to explore and contemplate, how are you feeding that thought? How are you keeping it going? It's another way to, in a sense, go through the cards, but look at your mind and see what's happening. But you find that you remove the fuel, you remove the, the challenge or the, the problem that you have in your life. And so that's a, a good thing to carry in your meditation. It's a useful tool. And uh, we'll talk about more stuff next time. Have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks man. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi. Yes. Uh, were Hold you on, able to I'm gonna, pause, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording. Hold on. Oh, you.